Unicorn Killer, and Carbon Copy Murders. Tales of hauntings, murder, and scary mysteries. Every week, Twisted Twos dives into a pair of unique stories that are worthy of a more in-depth look. For this week, we focus on the terrifying fugitive killer, Ira Einhorn, dubbed as the Unicorn Killer, and the strange tale of the Carbon Copy Murders. Get ready for Scary Mysteries, Twisted Twos. Number one, Unicorn Killer. Known as the Unicorn Killer because his last name means one horn in German, Ira Einhorn was born to a middle-class Jewish family in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. While studying at the University of Pennsylvania, he became an activist for various ecological groups. He also became part of the counterculture and anti-establishment movement. It's even said he was the co-founder and speaker in the first ever Earth Day event that took place back in 1970. In 1972, Einhorn met Helly Holly Maddox, a former cheerleader from Texas. The two fell madly in love and within days were living together. The problem was they both had different viewpoints. They would often argue and break up only to get back together again. Holly's family never really liked Ira. They said he was abusive of her and rude to them. One morning, Holly's co-worker noticed what looked to be bruising on her neck she denied it at first, but eventually admitted that Ira had been hitting her. From this point, Holly began distancing herself from her boyfriend. In July of 1977, she finally left him without bothering to take her belongings. She headed to New York City and started a new relationship with a man named Saul Lapidus. By September, Ira found out what Holly had done and threatened her to come back and take her belongings otherwise he was going to destroy them. She agreed to go back and take them. While back in Philadelphia, she went out to the movies with Ira and another couple, but after that, she was never seen again. Days after this, Ira asked some friends to help him dump a trunk he said was filled with secret Russian papers into a river, although it seems he never got the help he was asking for. When Holly didn't come home, Saul and Holly's family got worried and informed police. Einhorn was interviewed by investigators and he told them Holly went to the store and then just never came back. Holly's family, believing Ira was lying, hired two former FBI investigators to find out more. These investigators tracked down the couple that was with Ira and Holly that night at the movies. From there, they also learned of how Ira had been wanting to dispose of the trunk. Meanwhile, tenants in Ira's apartment had been complaining of the foul smell. The tenant living in the apartment below his even said there was fluid seeping through their ceiling. When the landlord tried to get into the apartment to investigate the foul smell, Ira kept turning him down. After receiving a thorough report from the private investigators, it allowed the local agents to gather a warrant to search Ira's apartment. The police searched in there on March 29th of 1979. They looked all over and finally found the trunk and the source of the smell. Inside was Holly's body, stuffed in there for 18 months. During the autopsy, it was revealed she had died from a severe beating. Einhorn was arrested, and he later told everyone the FBI and CIA merely planted Holly's body in his apartment because he knew about their mind control weaponry. Despite being held in custody, he was later released on a $4,000 reduced bail. A socialite had paid for him to get out because his lawyer managed to gather prominent individuals to support him. Of course, the moment he got out on bail, and just two days before his trial, he skipped out of the country and fled to Europe. For over a decade, Einhorn lived as a fugitive. He was tried in absentia and was found guilty of murdering Holly. When the case was aired on Unsolved Mysteries in January of 1996, an American Swedish viewer recognized the woman living with Ira. Police traced her whereabouts, which eventually led them to France and to Ira Einhorn. Although finally arrested, it would take several years more before he would be extradited from France. In fact, it wouldn't be until 2001 that he would be flown to Philadelphia to face a new trial. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. 
In 2016, he was moved to a minimum security prison because he was suffering from an illness. On April 3rd of 2020, Einhorn died in prison at the age of 79. Number 2. Carbon Copy Murders Two murders over 150 years apart, several eerie similarities. Are they a coincidence or were they meant to be? The story starts on May 27, 1817, when the body of 20-year-old Mary Ashford was found in a sand pit in Ergdington, a small village five miles from Birmingham, England. It was 6.30 a.m. when a laborer, George Jackson, came across a bundle of items, clothing, a hat, and shoes, close to a water-filled sand pit. He told the local police about it, and they decided to drag the pool, and that's when they found Mary's body. Mary Ashford had bruises on her arms and it's believed she had been raped prior to being strangled. Footsteps were found in a nearby field, although they couldn't tell who they belonged to. On Pentecost Monday, which was March 26th, Mary was seen walking from Langley Heath to Birmingham on her way to work. She stopped at the home of Mrs. Butler to visit her friend Hannah Cox, who was living there. She dropped off a bundle of clothing she was planning to wear to a dance later that evening. At 6 p.m., Mary headed back to Hannah's place to change into her outfit. The two went to Tyburn House, where they spent the night at the dance with Benjamin Carter and Abraham Thornton. The four left the dance at around midnight. Hannah went back home alone. Benjamin headed back to the dance while both Mary and Abraham walked towards Mary's grandfather's house. By 4 a.m., Mary headed back to Hannah's house to change into her work outfit. When asked where she had been, she said she spent the time with Thornton before he left. She appeared to be in a good mood. Mary left Hannah's home and was seen walking along the road alone just a little after 4 a.m. on March 27th. A few hours later is when she was found dead. Abraham Thornton was arrested for the murder. A confused Thornton couldn't believe what had happened to Mary. According to him, they had sex that evening in the fields and stayed there until 3 a.m. He then walked her halfway to Hannah's house. He waited outside, but left after a while when she didn't come back out. And that was the last time he saw her. During the trial, public opinion was convinced Thornton was the killer, but in the end, there were witnesses who corroborated his alibi. It was also a lack of evidence. He was found not guilty, but since public opinion was so strong against him, Thornton had to leave his hometown for the United States and Mary Ashford's death continued to haunt the Erdington community. Fast forward 157 years later, when on May 27, 1974, 20-year-old Barbara Forrest was discovered murder close to Chester Road in Erdington. Her body was found several days after her death. Autopsy revealed that she had been raped and then strangled to death. Forrest worked as a nurse at the Pipe Hayes Children's Home. She went missing on Pentecost Monday, just like Mary did. Also, like the previous case, Forrest was with her boyfriend, Simon Belcher, on the night before her death. The two had gone out dancing at a couple of bars. Belcher said he walked her to the bus stop at around 1 a.m., and that was the last he had heard of her. A huge manhunt was underway, and soon police managed to arrest a suspect, a man named Michael Thornton. Thornton was working at the same children's home as Barbara Forrest. Despite the accusation, though, and just like Abraham Thornton, Michael was later tried and acquitted of the murder. The two cases didn't just have similarities in terms of the manner of how the victims died, but the fact that both victims had siblings who didn't accept the final verdict. In addition, the bodies of both victims were found in Pipe Hayes Park, about 300 yards apart from one another. Aside from that, both women had experienced dread of the upcoming days prior to their death. Mary had reportedly said that she had bad feelings about the week to come, while Barbara Forrest told a colleague before her death, This is going to be my unlucky month. I just know it. Don't ask me why. So there were two of the most murderous and strange stories around. The world can be a crazy place, and Twisted Twos is sure to show you why. If you like this video, then please subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday for you guys to check out. Thanks for tuning in. 
and I'll see you soon.